We now begin the second session titled National Security Advisors Forum on Asian Security in a Fluid World Order. This is the first of its kind session which engages directly with serving national security advisors from various countries. The host of this session is the National Security Advisor of Pakistan, Dr. Moeed Yusuf, and the moderator of this session is Mr. Sayed Ahmed Marouf, Joint Secretary at the National Security Division. I request Mr. Sayed Ahmed Marouf to please come on stage. I also welcome the National Security Advisor, Dr. Moeed Yusuf, to please come on stage. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, session number two of uh, the Islamabad Security Dialogue, which is uh, National Security Advisors Forum on Asian Security in a Fluid World Order. I hope you had a nice lunch and a very sp spiritual uh, Juma prayers. Uh, All together, we have like uh, seven NSAs who are going to be participating in this uh, session. Uh, they are from China, the state of Qatar, Uzbekistan, uh, Republic of Kazakhstan, then Republic of Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the Republic of Turkey. Uh, before I start and uh, start the session, uh, Dr. Yusuf, if I may ask you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you may gave me many sleepless nights for uh, organizing this uh, segment of bringing together all the NSAs uh, of the region. Most of them have come that is, uh, uh, to, to this event. Uh, if I can ask you, what is the purpose uh, you had in mind when you decided to have NSS Forum at the second edition of the Islamabad Security Dialogue? Thank you, uh, Bismillah Rahman. So first of all, I think the Prime Minister mentioned this in the morning, you mentioned this now. I just want to be clear, this dialogue is not me. I am just one of the actors, the National Security Division, which is a full-fledged ministry, of the government of Pakistan is responsible for this, so I, I don't want to take any more credit than is due. Maruf, the issue, basically, as I uh, told the audience in the morning, is that the world is moving in a direction where Pakistan's national security policy and its promise of talking uh, or looking at the world in terms of cooperation rather than contestation. Uh, we couldn't have come up with this uh, in a more challenging environment. If you look at the forums around the world, a lot of them will have official statements only or some um, focus on experts and intellectual province. This mix is what we, we were missing in some ways for a, for a place like Pakistan. And the NSS forum, I think, brings that official voice. But uh, apart from my personal bias towards NSS, um, I think when foreign ministries interact, it's by definition very scripted. You have to, you know, it's, it's the, the policy that's being laid out. For national security advisors, I've always found there is a bit more leeway to talk out of the box, to think through what could be real um, innovative ideas in terms of moving forward. So I, I think this is a start. And as, as we go forward, um, I think in the years to come, we should uh, sort of work on maturing this in a way that this is probably going to be the only forum where such um, NSAs come together. And since we have focused on Asian security, it was only fair that we started with um, members of the Asian community. And that's why the, the countries that you mentioned. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. And I really sincerely wish that this uh, forum continues in the next, the coming editions of the Islamabad Security Dialogue. Security Dialogue. Uh, I think we have um, um, our distinguished guest from the People's Republic of China, His Excellency Mr. Zhao Keiji, State Councillor of the People's Republic of China. But quickly, before giving him the floor, I just want to lay out something that uh, the opening statement is uh, being live streamed and the uh, question answer session would follow the Chatham House rules. Uh, over to the State Councillor of the People's Republic of China, His Excellency Mr. Zhao Keiji. The floor is yours, sir. Distinguished Dr. Moeed Yusuf, Joint Secretary Saeed, friends. Uh, Distinguished 
打造地区安全磋商新平台，表示祝贺。It gives me great pleasure to attend the Islamabad Security Dialogue and take part in this NSA Forum session alongside senior officials responsible for security matters from other countries. At the outset, I wish to congratulate our host on successfully convening this dialogue and putting together this new platform for consultation on regional security. 呃，本次会议以世界变局中的扬州安全为主题，高度契合当前国际地区安全局势，可谓强风起势。当前新冠疫情仍未彻底战胜，乌克兰危机又接踵而来，国际和地区安全形势复杂动荡，安全问题联动性更加突出。传统与非传统安全威胁相互交织，安全问题跨国性更加突出。阿富汗、叙利亚等地区安全风险不但外溢至其他国家，安全问题多样性更加突出。恐怖主义、跨国犯罪、新型犯罪。网络安全等问题叠加共振，日趋严峻。Themed Asian security in a fluid world order, a topic that fully grasps the current international and regional security situations. This session is indeed highly relevant. On top of the ongoing fight against COVID-19, the Ukraine crisis adds more complexities and turmoil to security situation in the world and this region. Security issues are showing some salient features. They are more connected, as manifested by traditional security threats interwoven with non-traditional ones. More transnational, as demonstrated by regional security risks from Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq spilling over into other countries. And more diverse, as shown in the interplay of terrorism, cross-border crimes, new crimes, and cybersecurity issues, and their growing severity. 面对百年未有之大变局，没有一个国家能够独善其身，没有一个国家能够保当天下，没有一个国家的安全能够被分割。中国国家主席习近平高见远著，深刻洞察天下大事，创造性提出，共同、综合、合作。可持续的新安全观，并推动互助实践，对解决好亚洲安全问题具有重大的现实意义和时代的价值。Facing profound changes unseen in the century, no single country can do it alone or do it all or afford divisible security. President Xi Jinping of China. With great vision and an insightful understanding of the world, has put forward the new vision on security, one of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, and put it into practice. This is of great value for resolving security issues in Asia in our time. When facing the new world, the Chinese leadership has taken an active role in establishing a common, cooperative. 合作、可持续的新安全观，并与各方一道携手携手应对各类安全风险挑战，共同维护亚洲地区安全稳定，为构建普遍安全的人类命运共同体贡献力量。谢谢大家。Under the new circumstances, the Chinese side is ready to actively promote. And firmly act upon the new vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, and work with all sides to jointly respond to security risks and challenges in all forms, jointly safeguard security and stability in Asia, and contribute to building a community with a shared future for mankind, featuring universal security. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. 
Dr. Yusuf, would you like to ask him some questions from his statement? Thank you. Uh, State Council, it's lovely to interact again. Let me um, just, based on what, what you just mentioned, you know, I think what is absolutely clear is that the world is nowhere near the kind of tranquility that we would hope. Um, Asia itself, our continent, I think has emerged as a space for contestation, which seems to be making a mark ahead of cooperation. You've got Asian countries, you've got non-Asian countries who are involved in this contested space. So let me ask you in terms of the groupings in Asia and specifically exclusive uh, alliance structures or groupings, what is China's view uh, on this kind of approach uh, that we are seeing uh, in parts of Asia? Yan 至于一个秩序，就是以国际范围基础的国际秩序；至于一套规则，就是以联合国宪章为基础的国际关系基本准准则。各国应当摒弃独向安全、绝对安全的想法，坚持以共同安全、普遍安全为中，捍卫以联合
不得任习。痛视扬州也是开放的扬州，欢迎各方为扬州安全稳定发挥建设，发挥更多建设作用，努力实现互利共赢。谢谢。Today, Asia is a region with the greatest development, vitality, and potential in the world. Peace, development, cooperation, and win-win are always the mainstream in regional situation. At the end of the day, Asian affairs need to be run by Asians. People in Asia have the capability and wisdom to achieve enduring peace by enhancing cooperation. All attempts to disrupt Asian solidarity, cooperation, security, and stability are against the trend of history and will find no support. In the meantime, Asia is an open Asia, and all sides are welcome to play a constructive role for security and stability here, and for mutually beneficial outcomes. Thank you very much. If I may, just one more question,、um, which is that, I mean, the point is taken about the UN, the global system. Multilateralism and Pakistan's view itself is also that maintaining peace and security in the region and the world,、um, the way forward lies in multilateralism and cooperation and joint efforts.、Um, I've always been intrigued.、Uh, China and President Xi, I believe,、um, has come up with the community with a shared future for mankind. So, in that space, what does this cooperation-based security framework look like? For our continent. 赵各位，呃，我想再问您一个问题。您刚才在演讲当中也提到了联合国、全球体系、多边主义等等。巴基斯坦也相信，为了维护地区和世界的和平与安全，必须在多边主义的大旗下加强团结合作。同时呢，我们也知道，中国习近平主席提出了构建人类命运共同体。在此之下，您能否为与我们分享一下中国关于促进？以合作为基础的亚洲安全架构的主张。我感谢你提出这一重要的问题。下面我代表中方，就共同践行新安全观，促进以合作为基础的亚洲安全架构提出四点主张。Thank you very much for this important question. On behalf of the Chinese side, I wish to make four proposals. On jointly acting upon the new vision on security and promoting a cooperation-based security framework in Asia. 第一，坚持共同安全的价值追求，各国同处一个地球村，利益交融，安危入共。国家无论大小、贫富、强弱，都是国际社会平等意愿。要让每一个国家的声音都被听到，让每一个国家的安全利益都得到维护。各国应当支持坚信真正的多边主义，坚持联合国宪章、宗旨和原则，尊重国际关系基本准则，尊重和保障各国主权和领土完整。尊重并照顾各国合理安全关切，充分发挥联合国、国际刑警组织、上合组织等多边平台作用，共同谋划安全治理之策，共同应对各类的安全威胁。First, we need to pursue common security. Countries live in the one and same global village and enjoy intertwined interests and shared security. Regardless of their size, wealth, and strengths, all countries are equal members of the international community. The voice of each and every country deserves to be heard, and the security interests of each and every country deserve to be defended. Countries need to support true multilateralism, uphold the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. Respect the basic norms governing international relations. Respect and protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other countries. And respect and accommodate the legitimate security concerns of all countries. The role of the UN, Interpol, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and other multilateral platforms also need to be fully harnessed 
to jointly come up with security governance policies and address security threats. Dear, 既然持综合安全的理念之意，严重安全问题错综复杂，要以系统观念看待和应对。各国要多管齐下，综合施策，协同推进地区安全治理治理，始终保持对恐怖主义、分裂主义、极端主义三股势力的零容忍态度。坚决打击各类跨国有组织犯罪和新兴的网络犯罪，有效维护政治安全、经济安全、网络安全、生物安全和环境安全，努力为亚洲各国人民创造持久的安全稳定环境。各国还要同仇谋划应对。各类潜在的安全危险，注重发挥智库、专家、学者等作用，力争实现标本兼治。Second, we need to be guided by the idea of comprehensive security. Asian security issues are complex and complicated, calling for a holistic perspective and approach. Countries need to take multi-pronged and comprehensive policies. And coordinate on regional security governance. A zero tolerance attitude must be taken against the three forces of terrorism, separatism, and extremism, and firm efforts made to fight cross-border organized crimes and emerging cyber crimes, and effectively safeguard political security, economic security, cyber security, biological security, and environmental security to create an environment of enduring security. And stability for people in all Asian countries. Countries also need to make plans to deal with potential security threats and give full play to think tanks, experts, and scholars to address both the symptoms and root causes. Third, maintain cooperation on the security path. Different countries have different challenges, and the security needs and demands are not the same. Tensions and conflicts. 在所难免，关键是各方要开诚布公、平等相待，通过经常性的战略沟通、对话协商、学术交流等方式，求同存异，增进互信，减少误判猜疑，凝聚各国安全的最大公约数，以此难保安全对话。为推动各方对话做了很好的尝试，同时各国要不断地扩大合作的领域，创新合作的方式，以合作谋安全，以合作促发展，以切有利于和平解决危机的努力都应该得到支持。通过对话形成平衡、有效、可持续的全球。Third, we need to follow the path of security through cooperation. With different national conditions, different countries face different security issues and have different interests and concerns. So there is bound to be disagreement and dispute. The key is honesty and equal treatment. Regular strategic communication, dialogue, and consultation, and academic exchanges. Are ways to seek common ground while setting aside differences, increase mutual trust, reduce misjudgment and suspicion, and garner the biggest common denominator on security for all countries. The Islamabad Security Dialogue is a very good example of promoting dialogue. Meanwhile, countries need to expand cooperation areas, adopt new ways of cooperation, and seek security and advanced development through cooperation. All efforts conducive to peaceful settlement of crisis must be supported to forge a balanced, effective, and sustainable global and regional security framework through dialogue. Fourth, maintain a long-term goal of security. We must maintain security and advance in the development of security. We must maintain security and advance in the development of security. 实现持久安全
。各国治方安全部门要聚焦安全局势、疫情示弱等给本国发展及国际经贸合作带来的风险挑战，积极主动作为，稳妥缓解风险。携手保护“一带一路”在内的重大合作项目安全，推动实现区域经济合作和安全合作的良性互动，齐头并进。同时，希望各方能够相互互学互鉴，取长补短，共同提高安全治理的能力水平。Fourth, we need to aim at sustainable security. We need to prioritize both security and development, advance sustainable security through sustainable development, and safeguard prosperity and development through security governance to achieve lasting security. Law enforcement agencies of different countries need to focus on risks and challenges to domestic development and international trade and economic cooperation brought by the security situation and COVID-19. Make proactive efforts, appropriately resolve risks, and work together to protect the security of major cooperation projects, including those under the Belt and Road Initiative, and make parallel progress on both economic cooperation and security cooperation and virtuous interaction between the two. Also, it is hoped that different parties will learn from each other to show up weak links and jointly upgrade. The capability and level of security governance. Here, I want to say that China's peaceful development is based on China, and China is based on China. 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 追赃、追逃、追赃、能力建设等合作领域取得丰硕成果，有效维护了本国和地区的安全稳定。面对新挑战，中方将继续高举合作、创新、发展、共赢的旗帜，始终坚持秦城回荣的理念，坚持与邻为善、以邻为伴。深化与各国治方安全合作，分享平安中国、发展中国建设成就经验，始终做亚洲安全的维护者、建设者、贡献者，为推动地区安全治理、实现亚洲长期繁荣稳定，贡献更多的中国智慧、中国力量、中国方案。Let me say that. China's peaceful development starts from Asia, relies on Asia, and benefits Asia. The Chinese side is committed to bilateral and multilateral dialogue and cooperation on security with fellow countries in Asia. In recent years, fruitful outcomes have been achieved through those cooperation efforts on combating cross-border crimes, cybersecurity, fugitives repatriation and asset recovery, and capacity building. And security and stability in both Asia and the region have been effectively upheld. In the face of new challenges, the Chinese side will continue to hold high the banner of cooperation, innovation, rule of law, and win-win, and remain committed to building friendships and partnerships with neighboring countries based on amity, sincerity, mutual benefit, and inclusiveness, deepen cooperation with different countries on law enforcement and security, share our successful experience on building a safe China. And China, based on rule of law, China will always uphold, build, and contribute to Asia's security and provide more Chinese wisdom, Chinese strengths, and Chinese proposals to Asia's lasting prosperity and stability. 各位朋友，力量不在胳膊上，而在团结上。面对前所未有的严峻挑战，扬州各国唯有团结一心。才能战胜一切困难险阻。希望各国守望相助，同舟共济，攻克时间，并肩开创亚洲和平发展更加美好的明天。谢谢大家。Friends, 
Strength is not of the muscle, but in solidarity. Facing unprecedented and severe challenges, Asian countries must be united to overcome all difficulties and dangers. It is hoped that countries will help each other like passengers in the same boat to tackle hardships of today and join hands in ushering in a brighter tomorrow for peace and development in Asia. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, for giving, taking time to speak with us. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the next speaker uh, in the list is uh, uh, His Excellency oh. Mohammed bin Ahmed Al Masnad, advisor for national security to the Emir of the state of Qatar. The floor is yours, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, uh, let me first uh, congratulate you on the uh, coming uh, uh, month of uh, the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, let this month bring with it peace and harmony. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy today to participate in Islamabad security deal, which has proven as an important regional platform for dialogue at the Asian security in the fluid world order. At the turn of the millennium structure development in the global economic order and patterns of trade provided Asia with a new chance with the new chances. Many countries have capitalized on these structure developments, leading to uh, emerge the economic of economic powerhouse in Asia. Asia ch changes dynamic and causing a clear shift as the world is transforming to uh, accommodate to Asia growth. For example, the largest the largest share of future demand growth for goods and services including gas and oil are expected to come from Asia. However, the economic growth comes, ma uh, comes major hurdles. The huge economic potential of Asia has an uh, competition between global powers over influence and uh, resources. The connect today, this competition cannot be noticed anywhere more than Asia. This competition necessarily imposed the journey of economic development. Energy structure is both immediate and long-term challenge for emerging economic in Asia. The anticipation demand for Asia for natural gas is expected to increase significantly, significantly over the, uh, the coming years, especially with COVID-19 economic recovery. But now the energy security of many Asian countries with no long-term LNG co uh, contracts are at stake due to the new competition from Europe countries as a result of the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. Asia and the Middle East share common values, moral and respect for identity and culture. Asia and Middle East also share a sad history of colonization, as well as prolonged politic, political uh, uh, instability and conflict. As you all know, political instability impacted uh, negative, negatively on the national security and economic developments of neighboring countries. However, no positive note, uh, note, Asia and the Middle East enjoy one of the oldest trade links in the world. And this has not only continue to date. 
but it has gone for, from strengthening to strengthening and, re, and reconnect the cement that built uh, on, on the road. Invention will add impute to the stability trade links. Qatar relation with Asia examined at uh, um, um, participant rate. Most of our LNG volume goes to the Asia. Goes to Asia. Uh, we import most of our electronic cars, foods, so on, on from Asia to Qatar. And uh, Qatar and Asia are uh, uh, economically partners to each other. Very important economically partner to each other. Uh, this means Qatar and the Middle East share with Asia common future and their structure in uh, interlink we cannot ignore. The growing structure threats in our co uh, continent, yet it is important more than ever to work together to tackle the far possible uh, uh, propensity for all. I look forward to discuss and reflect with my colleagues on these issues today and consolidate with lessons learned, new ideas and possible proposals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, do you have any questions for him? Excellency, thank you and thank you to, um, uh, to the State of Qatar for participating. It's uh, always good to talk to you. Um, we had talked uh, briefly uh, earlier as well uh, but I want to, for the benefit of the audience, ask you specifically about energy. Uh, Qatar, of course, is, is one of the main uh, producers uh, of energy. Pakistan also imports uh, gas from Qatar. With the current turmoil in Europe um, and the situation of Ukraine, there is a lot of concern about supply of energy. I wanted to get your view on how we move forward as countries who cooperate with each other such that energy prices don't skyrocket and developing countries uh, like Pakistan and others don't have to bear the brunt of the conflict or the turbulence uh, in the world right now. I believe, uh, my friend, uh, uh, energy should not be used as a weapon or as to be uh, 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 to be uh, like a stick in the hand of, of, of the master. It should help all the nations in need. Uh, definitely the impact of the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine will have a big impact on, 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 uh, on the, on the uh, uh, trade of, of uh, fuel. But uh, as in Qatar, we are trying to uh, set all the you know, all the demands coming to us we are trying to fill but unfortunately the you know the amount of of, uh, of production it does not will not reach for everybody's need so in that sense we will definitely need to uh, adapt to uh, what's most needed and uh, you know and as you know, Your Excellency, uh, the, the, the gas today in Qatar is mostly stalled in, in previous contract, long-term contract. And what we will have is just the part that it's not yet in the market. So that is the, the, the area that we can move in. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, you did. And let me just ask one other quick question, which is um, that even in Asia and specifically in the Middle East, um, we haven't seen uh, peace for a long time. What is your prognosis about uh, regional peace and stability in the Middle East? Well, I believe that uh, we are in a better position today than uh, many other areas alhamdulillah that uh, yes we have some conflicts and this is not a new but uh, i am very optimistic uh, what's coming 
on the on the region. Uh, I think uh, as as uh, GCC, we have our conflict in, 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 in behind us, and uh, we are looking forward to put our hands together and uh, to work together. So uh, that's uh, and uh, I believe that there is a lot of areas that has been uh, brought up to discuss, like Yemen file with our uh, uh, neighbors, the Saudis, and I think uh, uh, it should uh, reach to uh, uh, stability, inshallah. Next, we have a video message from uh, the uh, Secretary of the Security Council of the Republic of Uzbekistan, his Excellency Lieutenant General Victor Mahmudov. He could not uh, make it to this video call because of his other pressing uh, engagements, but he was kind enough to send us his video message. Uh, please play the video message. Уважаемые участники форума, прежде всего позвольте выразить признательность пакистанской стороне за приглашение принять участие во втором исламобадском диалоге по безопасности. Нынешний форум проходит с участием высоких представителей стран заинтересованных в обеспечении мира и стабильного развития в нашем обширном регионе. Разделяем мнение об исключительной важности всего спектра вопросов безопасности Азии в меняющемся мировом порядке и полностью поддерживаем повестку форума. Его проведение крайне востребовано и заслуживает самого серьезного внимания с учетом нынешнего непростого времени и серьезных региональных и глобальных вызовов. Сегодня мир столкнулся с коренными переменами, которые характеризуются обострением как старых вызовов и угроз безопасности, так и новых рисков мировому порядку. С новой силой заявили о себе очередной виток гонки вооружений и милитаризации отдельных стран. Налицо все признаки глобального кризиса доверия. Серьезно пошатнулась архитектура и гарантии безопасности. Силовое разрешение конфликтов и достижение политической цели военным методом превращаются в обычную практику, обнажив кризис мировой дипломатии. Непредсказуемый характер глобального противостояния между крупными державами, сопровождающийся усилением враждебности, создает долгосрочную напряженность. Сложная и быстро меняющаяся ситуация в мире, а также возрастающие вызовы и угрозы безопасности находят свое проявление в Центральной и Южной Азии. Центральноазиатский регион примыкает к очагам нестабильности и конфликтов, испытывая на себе влияние всех негативных процессов. Афганское направление сейчас и в ближайшей перспективе останется наиболее актуальным в повестке региональной безопасности и стабильности. Сейчас Афганистан стоит перед выбором – встать на путь долгосрочного мира и процветания, либо погрузиться в хаос. Колоссальных совместных усилий наших стран – требует задача по недопущению превращения Афганистана в международный хаб терроризма, экстремизма и наркопроизводства. Одновременно, на наш взгляд, приоритетом должно оставаться активное вовлечение Афганистана в региональные процессы и реализация инфраструктурных проектов, проходящих через территорию этой страны. Центральная Азия – это регион огромных возможностей, но его колоссальный потенциал до сих пор не реализован. В этом контексте укрепление взаимосвязанности Центральной и Южной Азии открывает новые возможности. Однако реализация наших чаяний немыслима без создания надежных гарантий региональной безопасности. Хочу подчеркнуть, что придерживаясь принципа неделимости безопасности, Узбекистан не разграничивает угрозы на свои и чужие и выступает за самое широкое сотрудничество в этой сфере крайне заинтересованы в расширении взаимодействия со всеми партнерами во имя мира, прогресса и процветания. Уверены, что обеспечение безопасности, устойчивого развития, стабильности и процветания в Азии – это общая и выполнимая задача. Безусловно, сегодняшний обмен мнениями будет иметь практическое значение и станет еще одним значимым шагом в укреплении общей и неделимой безопасности в Азии. Желаю всем участникам форума плодотворной работы. Благодарю за внимание. That was His Excellency Lieutenant General Victor Mahmudov of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Dr. Yusuf, I'm sure you would have asked him questions if he was live, but uh, anyways. Uh, um, Just, if I may, for the sake of the audience, Uzbekistan is actually one country where uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of bilateral relations. And 
It's a country that Pakistan now formally has a joint security commission yes. uh, with, uh, in which we cover virtually all aspects of security yes. uh, on a very regular basis. Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, His Excellency Mr. Gizet Noor Doletov, Secretary of the Security Council of the Republic of Kazakhstan. The floor is yours, Excellency. Уважаемые дамы и господа, разрешите поприветствовать всех участников и поблагодарить организаторов второго заседания Сломовладского диалога по безопасности. В первую очередь хотел бы отметить своевременность и важность данного мероприятия не только для наших пакистанских партнеров, но и для всех участвующих стран. Обеспечение стабильности на всем нашем пространстве отвечает жизненным интересам всех без исключения государств. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to greet all the participants and express gratitude to the organizers of the second session of the Islamabad Security Dialogue. First of all, I would like to note the timeliness and importance of this event, not only for our Pakistani partners, but also for all participating countries. Ensuring stability in all our territories is in the vital interest of every single state. Угрозы терроризма, различных форм экстремизма, региональных конфликтов приобретают новую динамику. При этом современная архитектура глобальной безопасности уже не в полной мере отвечает новым вызовам. The threat of terrorism, various forms of extremism and regional conflicts is evolving, while the contemporary architecture of global security no longer fully responds to the new challenges. Мы с вами являемся свидетелями того, что на мировую арену возвращается риторика времен холодной войны. Усиливается противостояние ведущих мировых держав как в глобальном, так и в региональном масштабах, что не способствует налаживанию конструктивного диалога. Более того, данное обстоятельство ведет к росту конфликтного потенциала и прямых вооруженных столкновений. We are witnessing a comeback of the Cold War rhetoric to the world stage. The confrontation between the leading world powers is escalating both globally and regionally, which is a detriment to the constructive dialogue efforts. Moreover, this increases conflict potential and the number of direct armed clashes. С учетом повестки нашего мероприятия, большую роль в обеспечении региональной безопасности должна сыграть стабилизация внутриполитической ситуации в Афганистане, нормализация обстановки в этой стране, решение острых социально-экономических вопросов, недопущение угрозы гуманитарной катастрофы должны стать залогом благополучия для всего обширного региона Центральной и Южной Азии. Taking into account the agenda of our event, stabilization of the internal political situation in Afghanistan should play an important role in ensuring a regional security. The normalization of the situation in this country, the resolution of acute socio-economic issues and the prevention of a humanitarian catastrophe should be the key to well-being for the entire vast region of Central and South Asia. Все указанные факторы подчеркивают высокую актуальность переосмысления подходов к обеспечению безопасности и поиска новых форматов ее укрепления. Исламобадский диалог по безопасности вносит существенный вклад в данный процесс. All these factors underscore the urgency of reimagining approaches to security and finding new formats to strengthen it. The Islamabad security dialogue makes a significant contribution to this process. Позвольте изложить ряд предложений, которые, на наш взгляд, актуальны для укрепления системы региональной и глобальной безопасности. Во-первых, дальнейшее развитие и вывод на качественно новый уровень совещания по взаимодействию и мерам доверия в Азии. Мы полагаем, что СМДА обладает потенциалом, чтобы стать эффективным инструментом для совместного противостояния новым вызовам, и обеспечение безопасности и стабильности в регионе. Для этого важную роль могла бы сыграть трансформация совещания в полноценную международную организацию, нацеленную на обеспечение безопасности на азиатском континенте. Let me outline several proposals which we believe are relevant for strengthening the system of regional and global security. First, conference on interaction and confidence building measures in Asia needs to be further developed and advanced to a new level. We believe that the SICA has the potential to become an effective instrument for addressing new challenges jointly and ensuring security and stability in the region. In this regard, the transformation of the conference into a full-fledged international organization aimed at ensuring security on the Asian continent could play an important role. In this year, in the period of 12-13 October, the city of our country, 
состоится шестой саммит СМ, СВМ, да, который пройдет в год 30-летия совещания. Надеемся, что участники нынешнего мероприятия поддержат идею трансформации СВМДА в полноценную международную организацию. This year, which marks the 30th anniversary of the conference, the capital of our country will host the 6th SICA Summit on 12th and 30th of October. We hope that the participants of this event will support the idea of transforming the SICA into an art organization. Во-вторых, важно активизировать блок по вопросам продовольственной безопасности. Блок продовольственной инфляции не ослабевает, негативно отражаясь на уровне жизни десятков миллионов людей. Прогнозы говорят о том, что в среднесрочном периоде ситуация в данной сфере будет осложняться. На лицо прямая угроза масштабного продовольственного кризиса, о чем говорят как эксперты, так и мировые лидеры. Между тем, продовольственная безопасность напрямую определяет социальную и общественную стабильность. Это диктует необходимость неотложного совместного поиска решений. Second, it is important to intensify the dialogue on food security. The growth of food inflation does not weaken and it is negatively affecting the standard of living of tens of millions of people. Projections indicate that the situation in this area will become more complicated in the medium term. There is a direct threat of a large-scale food crisis, as it is stated by both experts and world leaders. Meanwhile, food security directly determines the social and public stability. This imposes the need for an urgent joint search for solutions. One of the most important mechanisms is the Islamic Organization for Protection and Safety, created by the initiative of Kazakhstan. Ее работа направлена на обеспечение населения стран членов организации исламского сотрудничества экономически доступным продовольствием. Полагаем важным далее расширять спектр деятельности исламской организации по продовольственной безопасности. Помимо этого, предлагаем начать экспертную проработку возможности создания региональной программы в сфере реагирования на угрозы продовольной, продовольственной безопасности. It's uh, one of the important mechanisms is the Islamic Organization for Food Security, established at the initiative of Kazakhstan. Its work is aimed at providing the population of the member states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation with economically affordable food, as well as stabilizing food prices through the establishment and management of a joint food fund. We believe it is important to further expand the range of activities of the Islamic Organization for Food Security. In addition, it is possible to carry out expert examination of the possibility of creating a regional program in the field of responding to the threats to food security. С этим направлением неразрывно связано обеспечение водной безопасности. Нельзя допустить, чтобы дефицит водных ресурсов, вопросы использования трансграничных рек становились причинами конфликтов и противоречий. Ensuring water security is inextricably linked with this issue. We have to prevent the water supply deficit and the issues of with the use of transboundary rivers from becoming the causes of conflicts and disputes. В-третьих, действенным механизмом для выстраивания прочной основы коллективной системы безопасности выступает экономическая дипломатия. В качестве наглядного примера хотелось бы привести развитие двустороннего сотрудничества между Казахстаном и Пакистаном. Страны прилагают максимальные усилия, чтобы взаимовыгодное сотрудничество обрело новый качественный характер. Товарообмен между нашими странами осуществляется через территорию нескольких государств Центральной Азии и Афганистана. По этой причине Казахстан крайне заинтересован в выработке региональных подходов к обеспечению безопасного и скоординированного транспортного взаимодействия. Third, economic diplomacy is an efficient mechanism for building a solid foundation for a collective security system. A case in point is the development of bilateral cooperation between Kazakhstan and Pakistan. Our countries are making every effort to ensure that mutually beneficial cooperation reaches new levels. The exchange of goods between our countries is carried out through the territory of several Central Asian states and Afghanistan. To this end, Kazakhstan is keen on de uh, to develop regional approaches to ensure se uh, secure and coordinated transit and transport interaction. Четвертых, одним из приоритетных направлений остается развитие международного глобального и регионального сотрудничества в сфере предупреждения и ликвидации чрезвычайных ситуаций. 
пандемия коронавирусной инфекции показала, насколько разрушительными могут быть последствия трансграничных угроз в этой сфере. В этой связи наши усилия должны быть направлены на создание и развитие механизмов совместного предупреждения и реагирования на чрезвычайные ситуации самого различного характера. Казахстан приходит на помощь пострадавшим от природных катаклизмов государствам, являясь активным участником гуманитарного процесса. Fourth, one of the priorities remains the development of international, global and regional cooperation in prevention and elimination of emergencies. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how devastating the consequences of such cross-border threats can be. In this regard, our efforts should be directed to the establishment and development of mechanisms for joint prevention and response to various emergencies. Kazakhstan comes to the aid of states affected by natural disasters and is an active participant in the humanitarian process. Уважаемые дамы и господа, мы должны прийти к осознанию необходимости формирования более устойчивой системы международных отношений. Наша общая задача состоит в недопущении появления новых очагов напряженности, повышении предсказуемости развития событий, упреждении негативного влияния различных угроз на развитие Большой Азии. Усиление дружественных и взаимовыгодных политических, экономических, культурно-гуманитарных отношений всех государств и международных организаций Азиатского региона является фундаментом новой архитектуры безопасности. Выражаем надежду, что решения и рекомендации, принятые по итогам второго заседания Исламобадского диалога, обретут свою практическую реализацию. Благодарю за внимание. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we must understand the need to establish a more stable system of international relations. Our common task is to prevent the emergence of new hotbeds of tension, increase the predictability of events, and prevent the negative impact of various threats on the development of Greater Asia. We must also proceed from the fact that reinforcing friendly and mutually beneficial political, economic, cultural and humanitarian relations of all states and international organizations in Asia is the foundation of new security architecture. We express our hope that the decisions and recommendations adopted following the second meeting of Islamabad Security Dialogue will be translated into actions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Yusuf if he has any questions to ask from you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Excellency. This is actually uh, very, very comprehensive. So I'll just ask one question, which is how do you connect everything you've talked about terrorism, food security, water security, the collective responsibility to the role of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which both our countries are, are part of. Because Pakistan's uh, focused uh, on connectivity and Central Asia is a big pillar of that. So where does SCO fit uh, into your vision? Thank you. Thank you. У меня есть вопрос, как вы объединяете все эти аспекты, территориальную безопасность, продовольственную безопасность, коллективный ответ на угрозы в роль политического? Пакистан сфокусирован на взаимосвязанности, и Центральная Азия играет в, этом, в этой сфере большую роль. То есть какая роль именно организации ШОС в этом аспекте? Безусловно, этот вопрос наверное, правильнее обсуждать в рамках саммита ШОС с участием всех членов организации. Вместе с тем хочу отметить, что взаимодействие в рамках ШОС – одно из важнейших направлений внешней политики Казахстана. Uh, so this issue uh, better be discussed within the SEO with all the member states. And, uh, in... <clears throat> and this issue and the interaction within SEO is the priority of the foreign policy of Kazakhstan. Наша страна выступает за сбалансированное развитие основных направлений сотрудничества сферы безопасности, экономической и культурно-гуманитарной областей. С самого начала шанхайского процесса Казахстан является активным участником работы в формате ШОС. Деятельность этой организации способствует росту взаимного доверия и понимания между государствами. Казахстан advocates the balanced development of all spheres, economic security, uh, cultural development and uh, 
and the national security. Uh, and Kazakhstan has always been an active member of the SCO, and uh, SCO increases trust and understanding between the members. По нашим оценкам, в среднесрочной и долгосрочной перспективе будет объективно укрепляться роль ШОС как одного из ключевых элементов системы региональной и глобальной стабильности. Спасибо. Uh, in the long term and the medium term, the role of SCO will be strengthened in the sphere of regional and global security system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Excellency. Uh, our next speaker is uh, His Excellency Lieutenant General Iman Kulov, Secretary of the Security Council of the Republic of Kyrgyzstan. The floor is yours, Excellency. Добрый день, уважаемые участники диалога по безопасности. My greetings, uh, dear participants of the dialogue on security. Хочу выразить слова благодарности председательской стороне, нашим пакистанским коллегам и лично господину Маиду Юсуфу за приглашение к обсуждению важнейших вопросов, влияющих на стабильность в мире. I would like to express my gratitude to the presiding side our Pakistani colleagues, and personally to Mr. Moeed Yusuf for the invitation to discuss the most important issues affecting stability in the world. Убежден, что озвученные на сегодняшнем заседании новые идеи и активный обмен мнениями послужат общему делу укрепления национальной, региональной и глобальной безопасности. I'm convinced that the new ideas voiced at today's meeting and the active exchange of views will serve the common aim of strengthening national, regional and global security. Современную ситуацию по своему накалу, жесткому санкционному противостоянию и непредсказуемым последствиям для всего мира без преувеличения можно назвать беспрецедентной. The current situation in terms of its intensity, tough, sanctioned confrontation and unpredictable consequences for the whole world without exaggeration can be called unprecedented. Сегодня международная информационная повестка несколько сместила стороны Восточной Европы. Однако мы уверены, что в ближайшее время все стороны конфликта найдут компромиссное решение и кризис будет урегулирован. Today, the international information agenda has shifted somewhat towards Eastern Europe. However, we are confident that in the near future all parties to the conflict will find compromise solutions and the crisis will be resolved. Проходящими там боевыми действиями воспользовалась террористическая организация Исламское государство, чтобы в очередной раз напомнить о своем существовании. The terrorist organization Islamic State took advantage of the hostilities taking place there to once again remind of its existence. Исламское государство надеется на затяжной конфликт в Европе что должно ослабить Россию, США и европейские страны, тем самым открывая для джихадистов новые возможности. Islamic State hopes for a prolonged conflict in Europe, which should weaken Russia, the United States and the European countries, thereby opening up new opportunities for jihadists. Более того, некие силы хотели бы организовать в Центральной Азии новый отчет направленности, аналогичный украинскому. Одним из сценариев является перенос боевых действий с Ближнего Востока, в том числе и с опорой на Афганистан, некоторые центральноазиатские государства. Moreover, some forces would like to organize a new hearth of tension in Central Asia, similar to the Ukrainian one. One of the serious scenarios is the transfer of facilities from the Middle East, including based on Afghanistan, to some Central Asian states. Кому-то очень выгодно создать в нашем регионе хаос, сопряженный с массовым насилием, войной, беженцами, разрухой, голодом и нищетой. It is very beneficial for someone to create chaos in our region, coupled with mass violence, war, refugees, devastation, hunger and poverty. Кроме того, введенные рядом государств санкции и различные ограничительные меры в отношении других стран только усиливают развивающийся экономический кризис исторического масштаба. In addition, the sanctions imposed by a number of states and various restrictive measures against other countries only strengthen the developing economic crisis of a historic scale. На этом фоне практически ежедневно мы слышим тезис 
о неизбежном продовольственном кризисе в мире. Уже сегодня наши страны, без исключения, ощутили на себе рост цен на продукты топлива, товары первой необходимости и различные услуги. Against this background, almost every day we hear the thesis about the inevitable food crisis in the world. Already today, all our countries, without exception, have felt the rise in prices for food, fuel, essential goods, and various services. Возможное дальнейшее ухудшение ситуации в сфере безопасности, экономики, энергетики, социальной жизни однозначно спровоцирует волны неуправляемой миграции и другие опасные процессы, разрушающие государственность. Эту неуправляемую динамику будет трудно остановить, даже исходя из менталитета местного населения. Possible further deterioration of the situation in the sphere of security, economy, energy, social life will definitely provoke waves of uncontrolled migration and other dangerous processes that destroy statehood. This unmanageable dynamic will be difficult to stop even based on the mentality of the local population. Как уже сейчас мои коллеги отмечали, с такими глобальными вызовами, вызовами самостоятельно не сможет справиться ни одна страна. Э, тем более, что многие являются недостаточно сильными в экономическом плане. As it was mentioned by my colleagues, no country can cope with such global challenges on its own, especially since many are not strong enough in economic terms. Кыргызстан призывает противостоять наметившимся негативным тенденциям путем расширения межгосударственного сотрудничества, налаживая партнерство в торговле, логистике, инвестиционной сфере и на других направлениях. Кыргызстан calls to counter the emerging negative trends by expanding interstate cooperation, establishing partnerships in trade, logistics, investment and other areas. В свою очередь, наше пристальное внимание сохраняется на ситуацию в Афганистане и на, и на Ближнем Востоке, где ведется сложная работа по противодействию терроризму и экстремизму. In turn, our closest attention remains on the situation in Afghanistan and the Middle East, where complex work is being carried out to counter terrorism and extremism. Серьезными рисками для безопасности давно стали факты нахождения в рядах террористских формирований выходцев из Центральной Азии, а также продолжающаяся активная вербовка наших граждан в этот театр военных действий. Serious security risks have long been the presence of people from the Central Asia in the ranks of terrorist groups, as well as the ongoing active recruitment of our citizens into this theater of operations. Особое место в борьбе за региональную стабильность занимает процесс перехода современного Афганистана на путь мира и развития. Однако будущее этой страны сложно предсказать. В настоящий момент афганцы сталкиваются с тяжелейшим кризисом продовольственной безопасности и недоеданием. По оценкам профильных структур ООН, 95% афганцев не получают достаточно еды. Уровень острого недоедания в 28 из 34 провинций высок. Более 3,5 миллионов детей нуждаются в поддержке в области питания. A special place in the struggle of regional stability is occupied by the process of modern Afghanistan's transition to the path of peace and development. However, the future of this country is difficult to predict. At the moment, Afghans are facing a severe food security crisis and malnutrition. According to UN agencies, 95% of Afghans do not get enough food. Severe malnutrition is high in 28 out of 34 provinces with more than 3.5 million children in need of nutritional support. В то время как в стране продолжает бороться с последствиями ужасной засухи, перспектива нового неурожая в этом году может быть связана с банковским и финансовым кризисом. Более 80% населения оказались в долгах. As the country continues to grapple with the effects of a terrible drought, the prospect of another crop failure this year could be linked to the banking and financial crisis. More than 80% of the population ended up in debt. На лицо гуманитарная катастрофа, которая ведет за собой новую волну радикализации людей, увеличивает законные и незаконные миграционные потоки, ставит под угрозу существование государственности в целом. We have a humanitarian catastrophe that is leading a new wave of radicalization of people 
increasing legal and illegal migration flows and endangering the existence of statehood as a whole. Необходимо также учитывать наличие в стране большого количества действующих и вновь возникающих вооруженных групп различной политической и этнопеременной направленности. С начала года как минимум пять групп заявили о себе как об антитарифском сопротивлении. It is also necessary to take into account the presence in the country of a large number of active and newly emerging armed groups of various political and ethno-tribal orientations. Since the beginning of the year, at least five groups have declared themselves as anti-Taliban resistance. Данные факторы могут привести к ожесточению гражданской войны и потере талибами контроля над отдельными регионами. В связи с ростом нестабильности в Афганистане, ИГИЛ использует сейчас получение новой территориальной базы взамен потерянной на Ближнем Востоке. Процесс проникновения ИГИЛ в Афганистан был не случайным и не стихийным. Его поддерживают серьезные региональные и, возможно, глобальные силы. These factors can lead to a bitter civil war and the loss of control over certain regions by the Taliban. As instability in Afghanistan rises, ISIS is seizing the chance to gain a new territorial base to replace the one it lost in the Middle East. The process of ISIS penetration into Afghanistan was not accidental and not spontaneous. It is supported by serious regional and possibly global force. Таких условиях, исходящих с афганской территории угрозы террористического характера и наркотрафика возрастают. С наступлением весенне-летнего периода мы прогнозируем увеличение террористической активности в этой стране. Under such conditions, the threats of a terrorist nature and drug trafficking emanating from Afghan territory are increasing. With the onset of the spring-summer period, we predict an increase in terrorist activity in this country. Наши предположения частично подтверждаются по партнерским каналам и публичным заявлениям высокопоставленных иностранных официальных лиц. К примеру, руководство Центрального командования США буквально недавно заявило, что Исламское государство в Афганистане продолжает наращивать силы и по-настоящему развернуться ближе к лету. Our assumptions are partly confirmed through the partner channels and public statements by high-ranking foreign officials. For example, the leadership of the U.S. Central Command just recently announced that ISIS in Afghanistan continues to build up its forces and will try to deploy closer to summer. Поэтому нашим странам невозможно игнорировать такой фактор ключевой угрозы региональной безопасности, как несколько тысяч боевиков ИГИЛ Харасан на севере Афганистана. Тем более, что с их стороны постоянно ведется работа по перетягиванию своей ряды живой силы из других группировок. Therefore, it is impossible for our countries to ignore such factor of a key threat to regional security as several thousand ISIS Khorasan militants in northern Afghanistan. Moreover, on their part, work is, is, work is constantly being carried out to draw manpower from other groups into their ranks. Кыргызская республика в сфере противодействия терроризму и экстремизму старается максимально использовать различные международные механизмы, такие как ООН, ОДКБ, ШОС и другие. Налажено тесное двустороннее сотрудничество с целым рядом государств. In turn, the Kyrgyz Republic in the field of countering terrorism and extremism is trying to make maximum use of various international mechanisms, such as the UN, the CSTO, the SCO, and others. Close bilateral cooperation has been established with a number of states. Одним из последних достижений Кыргызстана является включение 7 марта этого года террористической организации Джаматат Таухид Валь Джихад санкционный перечень Совета Безопасности ООН под названием Катиба Аль Таухид Валь Джихад. One of the latest achievements of Kyrgyzstan is the inclusion on March 7th of this year of the terrorist organization Jamaat at Tawhid Wal Jihad on the UN Security Council sanctions list under the name Katiba Al Tawhid Wal Jihad. Данная организация в Кыргызской Республике была признана террористической и запрещена еще в 2016 году. Она также запрещена в Узбекистане и России. Этот результат является первым положительным опытом ВДКБ и ШОС 
по продвижению подобной инициативы конкретного государства в структурах ООН. This organization was recognized as a terrorist organization in the Kyrgyz Republic and was banned back in 2016. It is also banned in Uzbekistan and Russia. This result is the first positive experience in the CSTO and the SCO areas in promoting such an initiative of a particular state in the UN structures. Таким образом, учитывая широкий спектр угроз Нашим странам, помимо сотрудничества в гуманитарной и экономической областях, требуется активизировать взаимодействие в сфере безопасности. Военно-политическая ситуация в мире прямо указывает на системность и комплексный подход к такой совместной работе, а также на ее приоритет в современных условиях. Благодарю за внимание. Thus, given the wide range of threats, our countries, in addition to cooperation in the humanitarian and economic fields, need to intensify cooperation in the field of security. The military political situation in the world directly indicates a systematic and comprehensive approach to such joint work, as well as its priority in modern conditions. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Excellency, uh, for your detailed uh, statement. And I, I would uh, request Dr. Yusuf to uh, ask you a question, if you have any, sir. Excellency, thank you and, and good to see you again. Just let me um, ask you of a possible, um, it's not a contradiction, but it's a challenge in, in what you've presented. You've talked about regional security, the need to work together. Um, at the same time, you've talked about connectivity, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, but then there is also the issue as you've raised terrorism, uh, drugs, narco-trafficking, whether from Afghanistan or elsewhere. How do you look at uh, connectivity and the SCO as platforms that can overcome these challenges? Because if we are going to connect, we are going to have people move, trade move, then of course the threat of um, narco-trafficking and perhaps other kinds of undesirable connectivity is also present. So how do you see SCO and connectivity between Central Asia and South Asia? Спасибо за вопрос. Уважаемый коллега, как уже мой казахстанский коллега отметил, ШОС для того и в свое время было создано для того, чтобы одним из главных задач этой организации, на мой взгляд, это обеспечение стабильности в нашем регионе и обеспечение безопасности наших народов. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleague. As uh, my Kazakh colleague mentioned before, the SCO organization was founded in order to uh, maintain the main aims as the providing the regional security and regional stability. В организации ШОС созданы конкретные механизмы для того, чтобы совместно государство, входящее в эту организацию, совместно осуществлять борьбу с тремя злами. Это с терроризмом, экстремизмом и сепаратизмом. Вы знаете... In the SCO organization uh, there are special mechanisms that help to the member countries fight with the three, uh, three evils, terrorism, extremism and separatism. Вы знаете, существует региональная антитеррористическая структура ШОС, есть исполнительный комитет в Ташкенте, поэтому Я считал бы, чтобы это, э, этот механизм доработал еще активнее. As you know, uh, there is the regional anti-terrorist structure under, under SCO uh, with a headquarter in Tashkent. And I hope that uh, this structure will strengthen and work uh, power, powerfully. И чтобы все страны, входящие в ШОС, проявляли активность и вместе собирались, и часто собираются по этим вопросам. Я хотел бы, чтобы, учитывая сегодняшнюю ситуацию в мире и в регионе, мы чтобы еще раз собирались, обсуждали этот вопрос и активно сотрудничали. I hope that all country members and uh, other non-member countries will uh, gather and activate the uh, collective work in this uh, sphere, and uh, I hope that the our participants will uh, uh, gather together 
as much as possible. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next, we have, uh, well, before uh, introducing the next speaker, uh, I have to make a small announcement. Uh, immediately after we are done with, the, with this session, I mean, we have two uh, remaining two speakers, we will go straight into the next session, which is basically when, uh, where our N former NSAs, our present NSA, will discuss uh, uh, the topic which is Pakistan in a changing world. But I will be switching my place. I'll be moving from here to the rostrum, and the NSA would sit here, former NSAs. So uh, now I invite uh, His Excellency Mr. Nawaf bin Said Al Maliki, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He will read out the statement of His Excellency Musaid Al Aiban, Minister of State and National Security Advisor of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The floor is yours, Excellency. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Anbiya wa al-Mursali. The first thing, I want to say thank you for Excellency Dr. Moeed Yusuf, National Security of Advisor of the Prime Minister of Pakistan, for organization the form of National Security Advisor of Asia country to discuss the future of security in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia believe the brief international understanding and cooperation on the base of the mutual respect and sovereign among all the country. The Kingdom formally believe that the future of the security in Asia is linked to respect the sovereignty of all the country in the region. Non-interference in uh, intimate affairs of other country and communication to international principle and resolution. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia continue cooperation with the Barton country and the international community to strengthen and peace and security supporting dialogue and peaceful solution and creating the right condition for achieving development and meeting the expression for the better tomorrow in the Middle East and around the world. The Kingdom reframe our support for bringing the peace process to find the lasting solution to Palestinian question with the establishment of any independent Palestinian state in a way that ensure the right of the Palestinian be able to establish their independent state in line with the international resolution. Exhalation of the conflict by Houthi group and their attack against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia demonstrate their unwilling and reject a peaceful solution as a way forward for the resolution of the conflict. The Kingdom called for the implementation of the United Nations resolution to help the negative follow out of the Houthi group and the supply of arms and ammunition to the Houthi group from outside of Yemen. Continue Houthi attack against civilians in the kingdom and undermining international navigation and global energy supply, both of the threat of the region, the kingdom, reserve the legitimate right to defend itself against missile, UAV, and other form of attack. We call on the international community to apply more pressure to Houthi group to ensure humanitarian assistance for the people of Yemen and bring political settlement to the conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia stressed the 
important of the Middle East free from weapons of mass destruction and support international effort toward this end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, while we try to uh, connect with uh, Turkey, uh, I think it's a good opportunity to move uh, 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 into another dimension, which is try to, you know, uh, flesh out what the previous six NSAs have said. And uh, let's see what our former NSAs and our present NSA uh, has to say about it. So I would request uh, General Nasir Janjua Sahib to please come to the floor. I will uh, straight away start off. Uh, uh, Mr. Janjua and of course Dr. Yusuf, uh, both of you have listened to good six NSAs from the region and some of them a little bit far away from us. But uh, I'm sure you must have uh, heard some common uh, themes in their uh, address. But here I would like to basically ask you guys to tell us how Pakistan, with that backdrop, with the backdrop of what the previous six NSAs have said, how you gentlemen uh, see how Pakistan should kind of uh, uh, basically navigate uh, its path uh, uh, given uh, this uh, fluid uh, international environment. Let me start with uh, Janjua Saab. Let me begin by appreciating Mr. Moeed Yusuf for his great job that he has done and also his team uh, in furthering the institution of National Security Advisor. I think you have come a long way and have established very solidly this institution which was need of the hour and need of our country. Thank you very much. You and your team have done a great job. Ladies and gentlemen, we have listened to all the NSAs and you would find that is a commonness while they talk of seeking peace and stability. The values to seek peace and stability are so much common to the world. And during the process of my experience, I have realized that while the war has been dictating the world order, the peace has also not been silent. The peace also seeks a world order. And this time, you see, is the peace which is trying to overtake the war order. All of them have given a kind of common urge to seek peace and stability. But I think we are slightly different than them. We are differently located. Our challenges are different. And if we have to look at the challenges, I just want to concentrate on this world, changing world order, or fluid world order. Our challenge resides here in this change and in this fluidity because the world has gotten into a transition. So in this transition, Pakistan is such a pivotal country, it is such a critical and crucial country that it 
has to face most of the challenges. In this change, there are a lot of pushes and pulls. And Pakistan is affected by all of them. In this change, if you see the trends of global power politics, so the leading trend of this global power politics change is containment of China. The next trend is prevention of resurgence of Russia. So for containment of China, Indo-Pacific strategy is at the play. This is our challenge. Not of our making, but we are affected. Sir, let me, let me just pause you for a second. Uh, I, this reminds me of the words by Tony Blair, the form, former uh, uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. At, sometimes in 2001, when this 9-11 thing had, uh, had happened, and he said that uh, very famous statement that uh, the kaleidoscope has shaken, the pieces are in flux. So this as I see it, this strange kind of echo in your voice when I'll try we to, are here. you know. So uh, what uh, uh, Tony Blair had said was that uh, the kaleidoscope has shaken, the pieces are in the flux. This was in 2001. Today we are in 2022. At least as I see as a Pakistani, I think uh, still the kaleidoscope is shaking and the pieces are in flux as far as Pakistan is concerned. So hard, not only within the region, but also across the world. And I will not go into the details, I mean, what are the pieces which are in flux and, and so on and so forth. But this, in this flux, how should Pakistan navigate? Let me ask Dr. Yusuf, how can we navigate through this uh, I think kind of. uh, you just cut me in a half. Sorry. What is flux and what is change and what is fluidity? No we will be talking the same thing. So basically it's, it's this change which is our challenge. Because we are being pushed and pulled. Nobody can be without us. Let me assure you, we are a country Nobody would like to leave us like that. So I think in this change, I feel the change is still far. Change has not really come about. The change is not really around the corner that you can shift sides. Change has started its transition, but it will take some time. So till then, please, stay at your own course. Don't look part of the change fully, because it will not benefit us if we just start siding. We have to charter our own course, look at our own national interest, and stay focused. Our challenge is to at least seek 20 years of peace and stability somehow. That is how we should carry ourselves in the arena, in the community of nations. Thank you, sir. If I just uh, try to take this discussion forward, you have said uh, charter our own course and 20 years of peace. But I think the problem is that uh, we are not insulated from the environment, the regional and the global environment. In the given environment, do you really think that we can chart our own course independent of what's going on around us? I think we have to continue to adjust and so on. Let me uh, ask Dr. Yusuf about this. Thank you. I think um, Nasir Janjua has made a very profound point without saying what he was saying, if I've read this correctly. You see, um, what could be a more apt time to be discussing change and charting our course and national interest. Uh, we have just seen in the last two weeks the kind of conversation we are having about the difficulty of charting whatever course Pakistan uh, thinks may be good or, or a direction that it, it wants to take. 
when we were drafting this national security policy and when we came out with it and talked about economic security and connectivity, so somebody asked me, you are talking about all of this, but I don't see the policy moving in that direction. And my response was that actually there could be no more, no greater challenge in terms of achieving the vision of the policy because we're a country that has two Western neighbors that are internationally sanctioned. We haven't sanctioned them, but they're internationally sanctioned. Uh, a neighbor to the east with which we have a completely broken relationship. Uh, and water to the south. So I think there's also some tyranny of geography when it comes to Pakistan. And I, I, we are neither insulated, actually no country is insulated today given the globalization uh, of the world. But especially countries like Pakistan who have espoused a path which is, uh, which does not subscribe to camp politics, is looking at economic security has to look at economic diplomacy as the key to the future. Because I think if we don't get the economic strength that we are looking for, everything else falls by the wayside. So the real challenge to me for Pakistan's foreign policy uh, going forward is how do we move from more political diplomacy to more economic diplomacy as we find benefits around the world. This is easier said than done, given the flux, but that's the direction we have to take. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, with profound apologies from uh, Lodi Saheb, uh, we have the Turkish NSA online. We will uh, uh, now invite uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Ibrahim Kalan, Chief Advisor to the President of the Republic of Turkey. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you all for uh, your kind invitation and uh, commend you uh, and my dear brat, uh, brother Muid Yusuf for organizing uh, this uh, second edition of Islamabad Security Dialogue. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person uh, for obvious reasons uh, because of the war to our uh, north, uh, which we're trying to uh, facilitate to uh, come to an end. Uh, I will uh, have a couple of things to say about that, but I think that this is a very timely meeting uh, that you're organizing because we need to have uh, uh, multiple voices, different voices from different parts of the world uh, because uh, we are still living in a deeply Eurocentric world uh, in which our visions uh, of world order, politics, international uh, institutions, economy, geopolitical conceptions are still shaped uh, by uh, this Eurocentric uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, world order. In fact, one of the problems that we have is precisely uh, our inability to overcome this Eurocentric uh, vision, uh, even though I think a lot of criticism academically, philosophically of Eurocentrism has been made, uh, and very good ones actually, uh, convincing ones, uh, primarily coming uh, from uh, within, uh, within the West, but also from Asia, from, uh, from China, from other parts of the world, uh, but we are still yet to overcome uh, its uh, lasting impact in our perception of culture, politics, society, artificial hierarchies, uh, and uh, all the way to other uh, more difficult issues such as racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, and other related uh, uh, issues. The reason I, I raise this issue is that uh, part of the problem we are facing, and this in fact goes to the very heart uh, of the Ukrainian war uh, that we are all trying to, uh, to uh, bring uh, to an end, um, is all related to uh, uh, the power disequilibrium that has shaped the international order since the end of the Cold War. Uh, the end of the Cold War uh, was supposed to give us uh, a new world order uh, in which uh, uh, principles of justice, equality, uh, fairness uh, uh, will have been uh, the dominant uh, principles. That did not turn out to be the case. Uh, the bipolar world uh, turned into uh, a, a kind of a unipolar world again, uh, and the power disequilibrium um, that was created after the end of the Cold War led to a, a lot of security anxiety. Uh, on the part of many countries um, outside the Western world, outside Europe, uh, in, uh, certainly in Asia, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Balkans, in, uh, in Central Asia, in the Middle East and other uh, parts of the world. So we are still uh, dealing uh, with the impact uh, of uh, this lack of order, if you like, or power disequilibrium um, that uh, 
has to be addressed uh, in a serious manner because um, we are hoping and trying very hard to uh, end the Ukrainian war. But once this is over, uh, uh, a new security architecture will have to emerge to address the security concerns and anxieties that have led to the Ukrainian crisis and to the war uh, that we are trying to end right now. Therefore, every step that we take to uh, deal with this crisis at the moment in regards to Ukraine, in regards to Russia, in regards to relations between Russia and the Western Bloc, NATO, uh, position of China, Pakistan and other countries, will have an impact on how that architecture will be built and shaped. Uh, and it will have, I think, long-term consequences in terms of how um, the security architecture uh, will impact geopolitical dynamics in the years to come. Uh, therefore, uh, we uh, uh, see it as really critical <clears throat> to see the, the long-term impact of the steps that we will be taking in dealing with the current crisis uh, at the moment. This new security architecture uh, will have to be based uh, on, um, uh, on, a, on a sense of belonging rather than exclusion, uh, and a sense of justice and fairness in the real sense of the term, rather than uh, uh, kind of a selfish, uh, uh, Eurocentric or any type of other ethnocentric understanding of uh, geopolitics. Um, and it has to give a sense of uh, a balance uh, between the forces of globalization on the one hand and the sense of um, one's own identity, self-perception, loyalty and belonging. Um, Globalization has given the sense of uh, losing oneself uh, in a sea of change. If globalization is like this big wave coming over you from the ocean, uh, you look for an anchor point. And usually that tends to be kind of a very narrow understanding of petty nationalism or nativism. That, of course, doesn't help uh, in a world in which everything has become intertwined. Uh, we all have to interact with the rest of the world economically, politically, socially, culturally, uh, and for a number of other reasons like security, the fight against terrorism, climate change, energy security, and all these other issues, they require us to have a broader understanding of world politics and our interactions with uh, different parts of the world. But on the other hand, uh, defending one's own, or standing up for one's own uh, sense of self-perception, uh, culture, history, and identity doesn't mean that we have to close ourselves up to the rest of the world. We have to strike a balance between this global understanding of the world and where we stand, our anchor point uh, in that world. I don't think the so-called fight, uh, struggle between the globalists and the nativists is the answer uh, to the question that we are trying to answer. We have to find another way, another uh, set of references, another framework uh, to address this issue because some of the questions that have been presented uh, are rather fallacious and they are misguided from the very beginning. We have to change some of the questions also that define, that have at least defined the parameters of the world order uh, over the last three decades uh, or so. So I want to invoke uh, one of the greatest scholars of Islamic history, someone who I'm sure everybody knows, uh, whose ideas and works have uh, stood uh, the test of time. Uh, Imam Ghazali uh, once said that that which exceeds its limits turns into its opposite. Imam Ghazali, who was a great scholar uh, of uh, Islamic philosophy, Sufism, law, uh, social and political sciences, but more importantly, really a man of uh, great insights and a great sage, um, wrote this principle in relation to uh, human affairs in general, whether philosophical or juridical, religious, legal or political. And I believe it's something that can be applied to everything we do, but more so, given the realities that we are facing in the world today at the geopolitical level, to some of the uh, uh, global international political issues. That which exceeds its limits turns into its opposite. When you overdo something, you lose the balance. If you are too protective, if you are applying a very narrow understanding 
uh, of your own interests. In fact, you end up hurting your own interests because all of our interests, security interests, economic interests, human interests, are intertwined. If I am sacrificing your security in the name of my own security, I end up actually sacrificing all of our security. Because in this world of uh, interconnections, interconnectivity, if you like, everything is related to everything else. And no one is safe until all of us are safe. And no one will be safe economically or prosperous unless everybody shares in that global wealth. If you look at the world picture today, the world has never been as rich as it is today in its history. But the gap between the rich and the poor has never been wider either. So we have a problem. Uh, and we have to address this issue, issue of security, terrorism, poverty, equality, access to uh, resources uh, on a fair basis. That has not been the case uh, for uh, the, the functioning of, uh, of the global order over the last three decades. I'm not even talking about the Cold War period, that it had its own dynamics. But uh, the period we are living through right now uh, is going to present more difficulties if you don't address these issues at their core. Therefore, uh, it, the Ukrainian war shall give us a pause while we try to end it, as I said. And as you know, we are trying our best as Turkey. We just hosted, uh, uh, I believe, an important meeting in this whole process since the beginning of the war over the last five weeks or so, probably the most important uh, meeting of the negotiators took place here in Istanbul with some concrete uh, outcomes where the two sides, the Russian and the Ukrainian sides, uh, have said that they made uh, progress and, uh, and obtained greater understanding uh, of their positions. And uh, we, uh, uh, we continue our intensive efforts uh, to bring the two sides together, to bridge the gap between the two and bring their positions closer so that the presidents of Ukraine and Russia can have a meeting soon sooner rather than later uh, to address uh, the critical issues in the Ukrainian uh, crisis. Like our president spoke to President Zelensky last night and he will be speaking in about an hour to uh, President Putin uh, again to follow up uh, on this issue. But I think this Ukrainian war uh, should uh, make us think and reconsider some of the assumptions that have shaped our understanding of the world, world politics, uh, relations between East and West, North and South, uh, global equality or inequality, equilibrium or its lack thereof, that is the disequilibrium that I, I refer to, uh, the Eurocentric uh, uh, architecture that has shaped uh, uh, global order for decades. All these things, I think, should give us uh, a chance to think about these issues um, and uh, imagine a different uh, set of issues and priorities so that we avoid the next war, next, next conflict. If we don't address these issues now, even if, we, if the Ukrainian war comes to an end, I don't know God knows when, I hope sooner rather than later, uh, we will be bound to face other types of wars and crises in our geography or in different parts of the world with major and devastating global implications and repercussions. Um, no conflict in the world can be described as purely local or localized anymore. Anything that happens any part of the world has this immediate impact on the rest of the world because now we live no longer in the age of the snowball effect, but rather in the age of the butterfly effect. The snowball effect age was more mechanical, uh, it was more incremental, it was more predictable. You know, you could see the snowball coming down from, uh, from the mountain, from the hill, and you can kind of calculate, like, how long it will take, what will be its weight, and where it will go, or where it will stop, or will not stop. But the butterfly effect uh, is a whole different game. Uh, something happening in one part of the world, having this huge impact, invisible at first, but could be devastating at the end, in another part of the world. Uh, and this impact with a little, you know, fluffing of uh, the wings of a butterfly in Indonesia could cause uh, a tsunami in another part of the world. And I think this is exactly why we are also so um, uh, at a loss from time to time to understand what's happening, uh, to predict what may happen, 
Uh, and uh, all this requires a different set of uh, tools to understand politics, society, culture, history, and other related issues. And there, I believe uh, the voices that will come from the non-Western world uh, will be extremely important and significant. We will, of course, continue to engage our colleagues and friends and scholars and experts in any part of the world. Don't get me wrong, this is not a kind of a third world anti-Western you know, uh, campaign that I'm talking about. I'm talking about serious engagement. Uh, but the voices coming from different parts of the world, from Asia, from Pakistan, from China, from Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, are as valuable and important as any other voice coming from other parts of the world. The, re the net reality is that the world order that was created uh, after the end of the Cold War has really not brought any kind of peace, uh, stability, or sense of justice to the world. Therefore, I think that requires us, again, as responsible actors, as agents of our own actions, uh, to look into this issue very carefully and, 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 and increase this kind of dialogue and consultation. Uh, the global order, global world order, whatever you call it, uh, has really failed to deliver on a number of issues. Um, that reminds me of the famous uh, quote from uh, Voltaire, who was once asked about the Holy Roman Empire, his opinion. And he said famously, it was neither holy, nor Roman, nor empire. And the global world order is really neither global, nor world, nor order. We, we have to redefine all these terms. Uh, if global means only a certain part of the world, it's not global. If world means only certain privileged nations of the world, that's not the world. And if order means a kind of a selfish, ethnocentric understanding of how world events should be run, that's not order. That requires, I think on our part, serious intellectual thinking, engagement, um, combined with uh, responsible policies that will, uh, I believe, overcome the deficiencies of the current world order uh, and give us a chance uh, to chart a new course as we face new realities uh, in the decades to come. I want to thank you all again for giving me the chance to, uh, to share these few moments with you uh, and uh, wish you the best of success uh, uh, in, in our meeting. Thank you very much, Excellency, uh, for taking time and uh, uh, speaking with us on this forum. We are really grateful for you to, uh, to be able to participate here. Thank you once again from all of us here in Islamabad. Have a good day, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Hey, wa alaikum assalam. Uh, sir, can you all, hear me properly? Sir, first of all, apologies for, you know, uh, keeping you waiting. No, we had some no, technical no issues problem, at our end. Uh, sir, um, uh, uh, I hope you were uh, listening to, you were able to listen to the NSAs who have spoken before, the seven NSAs of our uh, I've been countries. able to listen partially to uh, General Danjua and then uh, the, uh, whatever uh, Dr. Mohid Yusuf said after him and now also heard uh, Ibrahim Saab from Turkey. That is all. Sir, so, so, so basically, you know, uh, so there is one question, you know, I, having worked in the uh, National Security Division for the last one and a half year almost, uh, something that really intrigues me is, you know, uh, if you, I think it would be a fair comment to uh, state that the Pakistan's NSA's office is uh, probably younger or a new uh, uh, kind of an office compared to the countries which have their NSA's for ages. Having you having worked here, Janjua Sahib, you have worked here, so you are uh, our current NSA. Uh, let me ask uh, or begin from uh, Lodi Sahib, sir. What, in your view, uh, how you know uh, the office of the NSA? can be strengthened um, uh, and how, you know, uh, by strengthening the office of the NSA, uh, basically in, the, uh, in, in furthering the interests of Pakistan. So you have the experience, all three of you have the experience. Uh, so your take on it, sir. Um, uh, thank you very much. You know, whenever you, uh, uh, in, any, in any governmental setup, whenever you talk about the strength of, uh, of a ministry or of an entity or it, it, uh, it, uh, it depends at uh, one, that uh, how much uh, heed is paid to whatever you are saying, that is one point. 
and second more important is that uh, then whatever you say how it is uh, how it gets implemented and uh, that depends that what uh, all other ministries how do they behave with, with the NSA and uh, the directions given uh, regarding N NSA so in my opinion whatever I have seen I have been there for just about uh, two three months now I saw that whereas there's a lot of uh, potential in this office to work out uh, policies to evaluate things because he's he's a he's a comparatively at ease as compared to uh, you know uh, some other uh, ministries especially uh, the prime minister the, you know secretary is very uh, busy so he he has all the inputs and he can actually evaluate uh, what all is going on and uh, think over it and give his uh, you know uh, recommendations but then what happens to those recommendations? For example, this uh, a very fine document has come up, and I must congratulate uh, Dr. Mohit Yusuf for that. Uh, the, our new uh, the, the comprehensive uh, security policy. But now, uh, it has to be seen that how much the Ministry of Defence, and once I say Ministry of Defence, I am talking about all you know the others who are related to it. Uh, how much they listen to it, and Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Interior, these four are the key ministries I would send of course others also so for example if we say that uh, we, we we want people centric uh, security policy which is uh, which is very correct and the whole world knows uh, that nowadays the supreme national interest is the uh, welfare of the people of any country uh, so if we think that we are, our resources should be more aligned and we should be uh, more uh, active as far as you know uh, talking about our economy is concerned and we should make alignments and we should make our uh, foreign policy and our defense policy in a way that uh, we accrue the uh, economic uh, benefits. Uh, it, now it will depend that all other policies are also geared up in the same direction and they become subservient to this national uh, cause. Uh, so that is the main, uh, if I have to you know, uh, say it in a, uh, as a last uh, sentence, that the inertia which is there in foreign office, in defense institutions, in interior uh, uh, organizations, uh, the, those will, uh, will be the impediments which may not or uh, which will slow down uh, the, the desire of our uh, present national security advisor. Uh, thank you, sir. Well. Uh, thank you for your uh, intervention. Uh, the way my and our NSA makes us work, I think at the NSA's office is already on steroids. <laughs> so, uh, continuing the discussion, sir, sir, uh, you have, what is your take on this? You know, strengthening the office of the NSA. I think in our environment, NSA is a cultural change, and uh, it is very recent, very new, and it will obviously take some time for it to establish itself well. Earlier on, we have always been looking towards our uh, security institutions for such like issues, but now the culture is changing, and I'm sure this office is very positive and uh, this is making its contributions and two, three more NSAs are required uh, for this institution to get mature and everyone to accept this institution. And I am sure if we continue with this, there will be a oneness and uh, NSA will find his categoric place in the governmental setup and uh, there are various uh, suggestions how to strengthen uh, while I worked I had only three four people with me and now when I see uh, Mr. Mohit with complete team and uh, I think they have come a long way so there are many org organizational suggestions which we can always work out and make them acceptable 
and make this office efficient, not heavy, but efficient. And uh, this institution should grow, should continue, should mature like other countries because the change that we are referring to, the fluid world order that we are referring to, we are bound to confront security situations. So we must have a man who is committed to it dedicatedly, who's, who has everything under focus and then he can, he can be one person who can make his suggestions to the government. I thank you. Very well said. Sir, the last word from you, the NSA. It's odd that you're asking me how to fix my weaknesses. <laughs> um, look, I mean, I think, first of all, let me just say that um, what the work that was done before we came into, into this office is really what mattered to, for us to be able to build on. So there I think Jil Janjua and Lodi and uh, I must also recognize Sataj Saab, Sataj Adi Saab who, who worked, uh, who actually set up this division and then there were many before him. I'll say three things. One, first, I think there's a lack of understanding on what an NSA is supposed to do. And we did a lot of homework on this when we came into office, looked at other models. There are basically two things that are common and then different countries do it differently. One is national security dialogues with counterpart countries. And the second one is to be the principal coordinator on national security for the chief executive. So essentially, if you are going to be the coordinator, what you need is a hub and spoke model where you sit in the middle, you get inputs and then you crystallize or distill them for, for the chief executive. Uh, that structure, I think it's in place, but it will keep getting stronger as this cycle continues. And you're right, I think two or three NSAs, I was just chuckling because the quickest way to do that would be to bring in an NSA once a month and get, get through this in three months and see whether we get there. The point is, we have to understand the value of this office. And, and right from the chief executive down, this has to happen. Um, and I think to a large extent it has happened. The other thing is, um, you have a national security policy which is a mother document now, and its implementation is the responsibility of this office and division. Uh, that I think is in itself a critical role and, and more than a full-time job. Um, so I, I'm actually very optimistic. I think in, in some ways we have broken the barrier of this question of the value addition. Now it's just about making sure that it's rehearsed enough that the input that's going in is useful and, and, and our chief executive of the country and others around uh, can, can build on it. Finally, I'll also say that keep in mind there's no other body in Pakistan uh, apart from the National Security Committee where the civilian and military leadership sit together. And I frankly had not understood the value of that, um, that uh, setup in our, in our context before I came into this office. But I think it's, it's a, it's a um, uncomparable and irreplaceable kind of model to, to have the real conversations about strategic uh, direction and crisis management. Thank you, sir. Uh, control box, do we have some time or have we overrun our time? Yeah, uh, I think uh, we still have some time before the next session starts. Uh, let okay, me go we back to, to uh, Khaled Lodi Sahib. Sir, I would like to have your, uh, you know, uh, views on uh, the recently uh, finalized, approved, and issued national security policy. I'm sure you must have read it, the public version. And what do you get out of it? I mean, what is your sense of this uh, national security policy? And uh, if you, you kind of, you know, uh, see it in the regional context, geoeconomics, geo uh, the uh, connectivity, and so on and so forth, how this thing, the, I mean, this, it fits in into our region and beyond. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are you asking me? Hello? We can hear you, sir. Ah, okay. Uh, 
you know, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the best thing which has happened is that uh, uh, we have uh, officially and in a document recognized that the supreme national interest is the welfare and well-being of our people. And uh, if we have said so, and I think uh, if, we, if we can pursue this, uh, that would be a great thing to do. And uh, what I uh, I've understood after going through the, uh, the, that part of the document, which is the public, that there are certain things uh, which are uh, uh, totally our internal, uh, you, know, uh, you can say, uh, things that we can do with ourselves. Uh, and let me uh, list them, uh, just uh, two, three of them. And top of the list, I would say, is education. Uh, uh, then is uh, uh, justice and, and health. Uh, so, so nobody stops us from outside to improve our education system, to improve our health system, and to improve our justice system. And if I have to, uh, I mean, I will not like to prioritize them, but uh, I think justice and education are very important, and of course, uh, health also. But then, there are certain things which are regional or, uh, uh, you can say, uh, transnational, uh, in a way, uh, and uh, economy is one of them. Uh, the, then is, of course, uh, 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 this uh, media, the part that media is playing, which is perception management, again, which is related to the security of the people. So I think uh, in the region and, and beyond also, our full effort should be to increase the number of friends and to decrease the number of enemies. And we should also uh, keep in mind that being uh, an enemy does not, or being an antagonist on any, uh, because of any reason, does not necessarily mean that we should cut off all communications. This is, uh, this is one thing which I think uh, uh, we must try to understand. And keep in mind the last episode with this undirected missile which came uh, to Pakistan from Indian side. I mean, if there was one thing which I felt uh, which was badly missing was uh, the communication between the two countries. Well, you know, once you are, you are neighbors uh, to nuclear power with no reaction time, and there should, there's no hotline between your uh, prime ministers and between your NSAs and between the army chiefs. It is killing. It is putting at uh, jeopardy the lives of 1.5 billion people of this area. So I think if we have to look after the welfare of our people, we have to look beyond our prejudices, and our perceptions, we can, uh, we, we can have our problems, all right. We can, uh, we can live with them, we can uh, talk on them. But if you don't talk, how will you resolve your issue? Uh, so in my opinion, uh, communication, not only this uh, electronic communication, but also physical communication, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, connectivity. Uh, that, should be, that should become our priority. Uh, I'm talking about the external factors. The internal factors I've already said that if you do, if you, if you have, if we have, if we continue with the same justice system, which is prevailing today, where uh, uh, a labor on the street and the prime minister of uh, the country is not satisfied with that, then what are we doing about it? Why are we sitting on it? And similarly, the education system and, uh, of course, uh, the health. We have, we are doing a, a bit on the health side also. And uh, this perception management, again, we have to save our people. Uh, you know, uh, it is a war of narrative. So not only that, we have to fight back uh, the negativities which are being uh, fed to our people, but we also have to create some positivities in the minds of our own people, because mind is the ultimate uh, target of, uh, of your detractors. So I would say that uh, we must pay attention to connectivity. We must pay attention to communication especially with India also, and uh, then also we must uh, try to have both positive uh, and defensive attitudes, uh, defensive mechanisms as far as perception management and perception modification uh, techniques are concerned. These are now proper sciences uh, which are working. So if I have to say uh, uh, two things, I would say internally, education, health, justice, externally, connectivity and perception management. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I just picked a phrase from your uh, statement that you, we should uh, strive to uh, decrease the number of enemies and try to increase the number of friends. That's a very good, uh, it sounds very good. 
and I really liked it. Uh, but sometimes it happens that uh, you, your enemy wants to be uh, to remain your enemy, even though you want him to be your friend. So sometimes you are in a fix. Sometimes that situation occurs. But anyways, True. sir, uh, coming to uh, um, General Janjua sir, uh, sir, connectivity. Uh, of course, con connectivity is uh, an important element of in, in the overall uh, national security policy, uh, regional connectivity. So, uh, while I would request you to give us a broader overview of what you think about the national security policy, and a second question, a, a short, a small question to it is that uh, there is, uh, uh, just to borrow a phrase from NSA, he often uses the elephant in the house. So, I mean, uh, if we have to connect regionally, there are certain issues, I think, uh, which do not actually kind of uh, augur well for actually implementing this uh, connectivity, um, the idea of connectivity. There are so many issues. And uh, is it fair to say then that uh, uh, the national security policy, although it is very good on paper, but some of its aspects are such that they are dependent uh, on the environment and then you have to kind of, uh, you know, again, navigate through that and perhaps some of the parts may have to wait till the time the environment is good. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. When I look at national security policy, I outrightly take it as a step in right direction. This is what we needed. I also look at it thankfully that yes, today we have a national security policy. And then, since we are a nation with our inspirations, we are a versatile nation, the world is also ever changing. So when we have something, we can always amend it we can always correct it, we can always improve it. So basic thing is that today we have a national security policy. Why do I say thankfully about this? Because it is back in 2010 that I was deputed by General Kiani from Army side to come to President NDU who was actually tasked to formulate a national security policy. And it was in 2010 that we started working on this. And we had members from all the ministries coming to NDU. We had the faculty sitting there. And then I was lucky I was myself posted as President NDU. So then it became my domain and I know that how many interactions that we have had. So I deposited one before I went to Commander Southern Command. So when I came back I got it, you know, with, with, with a lot of improvements by Sadiq Saab. He had worked on it. So everyone worked on it then as NSA, it was really, really my ambition you can say, was my purpose, was my mission to let it go, let it be issued. But obviously I was dogged by Don League, I was dogged by this Panama, and then there was not an environment of national consensus. So we were into a different thing. And thank God, it then uh, Mohit Yusuf Sahib got an opportunity, he worked on it, and I really appreciate that he went through, you know, I handed over this to Jan Lodi, Jan Lodi worked over it. And then it came to Mohit Yusufsa. So we all in the line have worked on this. And thank God, today we have a national security policy. Now we can always do whatever we like with this to serve our national interest. And concept of Security has always been, you know, redefined with the passage of time. 
it is under a redefinition because war has also been redefined the war is no more restricted to the borders the war has also permeated right into our people so war has changed its character so the concept of security has also been altered the concept of security also needs to be revisited redefined and hence basically people are affected by this kind of war so people become the stakeholders the states are then responsible for ensuring their well being for ensuring their security hence the people have become the stakeholder of the overarching concept of security so this is one attempt that we have made along with jan lodi and all of us this is the first attempt and we can always improve it with a change in the environment so it's there alhamdulillah it is there thank you thank you sir no sir, connectivity sir, the last word from the nsa i tell you there's so many things in which our future resides our people and then obviously so much more and connectivity is also our asset is the essence of our economic prosperity in the coming years the pressure the stress that we are undergoing is again this connectivity you have a fair idea that the future century belongs to asia all the economic predictions are there yeah. so asia is being stalled who is there in asia china anything which is done against china affects you because we are correlated now russia so these are the future challengers of us and from the region who has become ally of us is india so actually our region has been altered its security apparatus has been fiddled badly without any sensitivity but the fact of the matter is that future world is asia so one of the prominent thing of this asia is connectivity and look at the connectivity potential of whole of the asia is north and semi north is frozen pacific is too far sorry we are co-located with europe so only opening is in in the ocean and now indian ocean if makes the mouth of asia i have been telling my indian friends that you are a water locked and land locked country from india where do you go from pakistan you go everywhere in asia from iran combined so this is the connectivity that is our asset and we have to build on that cpac is just half of the dream of this prosperous future the other half resides in afghanistan central asian republics going up to russia in good times then iran and europe so this is the future world so this will come about through this connectivity i thank you thank you very much sir sir last word for you i think jan jan you have summed up very well look i mean i why do we need an nsp this was the first question i asked when i came into office and not one but i think there are about 10 15 drafts that were on my table um and the reason i essentially concluded this was this had to be my top priority was that when i went around asking people people who matter in the country uh, decision makers uh, what is national security the answer would be people you know broad kind of conception and then i would say 
let's put this down on paper and everybody would say, no, it's too amorphous, it's not easy to bring together, so perhaps. And then I realized that unless we can put this on paper, the first step will not be taken. So I think that's exactly what this is. It's a statement of intent. It doesn't show Pakistan's reality today. It shows where Pakistan intends to go. But let me just say this myself because a lot of people have asked me. It's essentially a piece of paper unless we are able to implement it. And that's the real challenge. Uh, how do we move from here in terms of implementing this policy? And for that, unfortunately, it's not in the public eye, but we have a very, very detailed, exhaustive plan which is already underway. Um, but it's not going to be easy. And just going to your connectivity point to, to conclude, uh, I repeat, I mean, Jan Janju has right, what Jan Lodi has said is right, but I ask a simple question. Two internationally sanctioned neighbors on the West, and India that is going from bad to worse, what does connectivity mean for Pakistan? So we are in a suboptimal situation, but the intent is very clear, the direction is clear, and we've got to find our way to move forward within this minefield. Just because things are not where we want them to be, if it was ideal, everybody would be connected. So that's the challenge, and we'll, we'll, we take it up. I think we had a wonderful and quite a thorough discussion on uh, by the NSAs, the, the, the seven NSAs who spoke before, then our own NSAs, our veteran NSAs, our current NSA. They have spoken their hearts out. Uh, without further ado, I would just uh, thank you, sir, Janjua, Lodi Saab, thank you very much, NSA you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you.